church, we are in the presence of God. Um, this doesn't happen every day, and it doesn't happen everywhere. And so when you are there, you're in that space, you're among those people. I pray that we would just gather it in. We'd embrace it. The reality today, though, is um, we can be a people who long for God. We can be a people who desire to follow. But we're also a people that need to heal. Because of the fall and because of Adam and Eve and all those matters that we read about in the book of Genesis. We live in a broken world. And we're among a broken people. And so today in the next installment of our Learning to Follow series, we need to learn how to heal. Learning to be with Jesus, learning to listen to Jesus. Those are things that we desperately get to do. Those are things that we desperately want to do. But then there comes this point where we're still broken. God has taken us, Jesus has invited us just as we are. Thanks, Billy Graham, right? Just as I am. He's taken us. He's taken us with all of our brokenness. He's taken us all of our in, inadequacies. He's taken us. But he doesn't want us to remain there. When Jesus calls his disciples in Matthew chapter 4 and immediately they go into ministry and, and, and you, you catch up with me here in, in, in Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, and Jerusalem, and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. There's 84 references to healing in the book of Matthew alone. Jesus knows about healing. He knows that we're broken. He knows that we come and follow him in our inadequacies. So we all need healing. It's not whether or not you're here today and you need it or not. We all establish together as one body, we are in need of healing. We all have some desire to be healed. And the beauty is that there's nothing in you or about you that cannot be healed. Physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. And here is the greatest truth that you may hear today. The Bible tells us that we're allowed to ask for it. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and you pick it up in verse 7, it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. That is part of my Bible. It's part of your Bible, and it's the truth of Jesus today. That we're allowed to not only desire healing in our life, we're allowed to Ask for it. If you're here today and you're in need, some of, you're in need of, of some known healing, you're allowed to ask for it. And better than that, you're allowed to continue asking for it. My, my friend Daniel McNaughton, who has um, uh, supremely influenced this series of messages and has, has written tremendous amounts of material about being a follower of Jesus. He, he says it this way when he talks about learning to heal. He says, I wish I understood why God chooses to heal sometimes and not others, but I do not. But you never want to be said about you that you could have had a healing, but you didn't ask. So ask and trust God. 
As followers, we want to be open to God's supernatural power of healing. Amen? Do you want that in your life today? We need to ask for it. The Bible tells us that we're allowed to ask, we're allowed to seek, we're allowed to knock. Charles Spurgeon, the great theologian, said, faith asks, hope seeks, and love knocks. When we're asking for something, it suggests that we're dependent on someone else. If you have to ask for something, by nature, by definition, you can't do it yourself. If you need information, you ask for it. If you need a piece of uh, paper, you ask for it. By asking, you dem demonstrate your dependence. Seeking. It suggests that we're yearning for something, something that we're looking for. We're seeking it. We yearn. You're going after it. You're seeking it. Knocking suggests that you're persistent. When you knock, you don't knock once. You knock what? Several times. Think about it. Think about your knocking practices you never just go, right? We always, because we're persistent. We want that which we're knocking for. And so the Bible tells us that we're allowed to ask, we're allowed to seek, we're allowed to knock. And this is not simply like one author said it. He, God is not some celestial um, slot machine. You don't just keep pulling on God until he gives you something. Don't play. Don't gamble. It's an addiction. Okay? Like, don't just keep pulling on God like he's going to give you what you want. The, the nature of this passage in, in Matthew chapter 7 is not treating God like some celestial um, uh, uh, slot machine. It, what's, what undergirds, what was underneath this passage where we can boldly ask and seek and knock is this idea that we have a life that is humble and sincere and pure and loving. It's that we're a follower. Followers can apply Matthew chapter 7 in their life. When you're following Christ, when you're learning to listen, when you're learning to be with him, when you're learning to heal, you can go and ask and seek, and knock. Now when we think about healing, it involves God's will, right? Whenever time we, we think about, well, is it God's will that I'll be healed? One of the things that I need us to realize is that God's word is God's will. If you want to begin to know whether or not something is about God's will, check first in his word. God's will is God's word. God's word is God's will. And so before we ever say, is it, the, is it the will of God for my life for this to be or for that to be, begin in his word. Is it in his word? Is it confirmed in his word? If you want to know the will of God, we need to know God's word. Because his word is who he is. It's what he does. It is what he wants for us. It's how he operates. Let's first search the already revealed will of God. Amen? The Bible is the already revealed will of God. It's not the yet to come. It's the already. And so when we're looking for the will of God, we look in his word. It's the already revealed will of God. Thomas Aquinas says, fear a man of one book. If you're a people of one book here today, if you're a person of one book, you are to be feared. It isn't that we try to do the horoscopes on Sunday afternoon and we try to do Bible on Monday morning and then we try to do Oprah on Tuesday afternoon and we try to do Joel on Thursday night. Are you a person of one book? The will of God is the word of God. And so let's be a people of one book. Because here's what the book says, church. The book says that God is a healer. God is a healer. The Bible tells us that God, the healer, from the beginning. And we know the story, right? We were perfect in the beginning, but somehow we became imperfect. And so all the sicknesses, all the disabilities, all the dysfunction in our culture comes from that result of that fall of mankind. And so here, let me take you on a little story. Stay with me. So this fall happens, and several generations later, 
after Adam and Eve, there's a group of people called the Israelites. And we talk about them almost every week. The thing we talk second most about in this place is Israelites because we talk about Jesus most. But we're always using the Israelites as an example. I don't know why, because they're like the main of the Old Testament. And so the Israelites, a couple generations after the fall, they are traveling through this desert. And God reveals to him that he is their healer. He declares to them that he is a healer. And I want to draw your attention to Exodus chapter 15. And I want to just give you a brief story. I don't know how brief it is, but I don't want to lie. It may be long. (laughs) We'll see. And it's in, the text is in Exodus 15, 23 through 26, but I need to set it up. A, A guy named Tony Evans, great preacher. This week I was reading a sermon of his, and he described what happens in this passage of Scripture so beautifully that I want to share uh, pieces of what he said. And so we realize, if we know a little bit about the Israelites, the Israelites were a people that were God's people. It was God's family, and God had sent them uh, different places, and he had given words, and, and he, he basically said, and through these different one line of family, he said that I'm going to give you this promised land. And ultimately, because of their disobedience, they found themselves in captivity to the Egyptians. So there's foreign captives. Well, God, re- God delivers them, and part of the deliverance is the parting of the Red Sea, and they go through it. And on the other side of the Red Sea is about right where we pick up the story. In chapter 15, chapter 15 of Exodus begins with a song and a celebration. They have a worship service about what God had done. God had delivered them from the Egyptians. And so in the beginning of chapter 15, they begin with a song, and immediately they leave the Red Sea, and it says they entered the desert of Shur. And as they're going through the desert of Shur, they go three days without water. God had not provided water, And so they are traveling three days, they're thirsty, they want something to drink, and they come upon the water at Merah, Merah. and they're thinking, God provided water for us. He provided water, and we're one, thank you God, thank you God, and when they walk up to this this, um, uh, water source, they find that it's unusable water. They have a water problem. This water that they were longing for, they were thirsting for, is bitter water. It's undrinkable. And they begin to grumble. God, you you were going to give me this water, and we asked you for it, and, and now it's bitter. Why would you give us something that we cannot use? They have a water problem. Isn't it interesting that their miracle three days earlier was a water problem, right? And three days later, they got another water problem. And the thing that's also similar is that there are no visible solutions as they enter that situation. So they're at the Sea of Mara, they're at this water source of Mara, and there is no visible solution to this water problem. And so they begin to grumble. And I wonder today if we don't know the next line of this sermon, which is, it doesn't take long to forget what God can do, because it doesn't take long to forget what God has done. It's three days later. They had been delivered from a water problem. And now they have another water problem and they start to grumble because they don't think God's going to be able to take care of this water problem. And so we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Verse 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and the law for them and there he tested them. 
He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who, what? Heals you. I'm going to take care of this water problem. Church, God takes care of this water problem. Here's what I need you to understand. The Israelites had a water problem. You don't have a water problem. You got some other problem. Church, we serve a healer. We serve a healer. We serve one who knows your circumstance. We serve one who knows who you are and he knows what you need. And here's what I want to let you know. Uh, Tony Evans points out that the Israelites were in the desert of Shur in the will of God. Listen to this. God led them there. So often when we're in the wilderness or when we we're, have a problem, when we have an issue, we immediately think that God's not there and we're not in God's will. The Israelites were in the desert in the will of God. So where you're at today, it may be exactly where God wants you to be. The things that you're walking through may be exactly what God wants you to go through. You can be in a tough spot and be in the will of God. And so God may be doing something in this season. It doesn't mean that he's not a healer. It doesn't mean that he's not going to heal. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to heal you. But you can be in the desert. You can be in a hardship even in the will of God. Following sometimes requires more than an amen. Can I get an amen? Sometimes it requires more than lip service. Following sometimes requires walking through a test. Walking through a difficult time. And so we see in verse 25, Moses cries out to God. And I don't understand. It seems unorthodox to me. But God says, here's a piece of wood. Throw it in the water. And all of a sudden, this water goes from bitter to better. Actually, better than bitter and better. It's exceptional. It's sweet, it says. I haven't drank too much sweet water, have you? The tap water I drink, even the purified Brita water, doesn't taste that good. So this is better than expected. And here's what I want us to see. The, 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 the theme changes abruptly at that point. It's no longer about bitter water at that point. God is showing them that this is larger than just bitter water in a water source. He's talking about the bitterness of their hearts. He's saying, listen, I have done these things for you. I have delivered you time and time again. But you're still bitter. You're still grumbling. And he says in those verses, if you will be obedient to me. Well, let's look at it again because it's too important to just skip over. The, the, uh, it's the end of the 25, if you can follow me, Andy. End of 25. There the Lord made a decree. I didn't call him babe because I know he's back there. So the babe is over here. Andy's back there now. I normally say, babe, can you go back there? There the Lord made a decree and a law uh, for them, and there he tested them. He said in verse 26, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees. What's that sound like to you? Does that sound like a word that starts with an F? Following? Following? Amen? He's saying, listen, if you'll follow me, you can expect healing. You can know that healing's coming. That's what the truth of this passage is. Listen, don't be bitter about your circumstance. Don't be discouraged. Don't start to grumble. I've got you right where I want you. And if you'll follow me, I'll heal you. I'll heal you. Church, we need to learn how to heal. And the, 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 the Hebrew word here is Jehovah Rapha. Everybody say Jehovah Rapha. The God who heals. 
He's not just the creator God. He's not just the provider God. He's not just the sustaining God. He is the God who heals. He is the God that can heal you today. He longs to heal your resentment. He longs to heal your bitterness. He longs to heal your pride or your sin or the consequences of your sin. God is not simply the creator or the provider or the sustainer. God is the healer and his heart has not changed since Exodus chapter 15. It's still the same today. So we are able to confidently pray because he's a healer and it's part of his character. Hebrews 4, 16 says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? With confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of what? In need. You can be in the will of God and be in an area of need in your life. He wants you to come confidently. He wants you to see him as healer. He wants you to come in and say, listen, God, you are my Jehovah Rapha. You are my healer. You are the one that can heal me. Church, I don't know how much you know about Jesus. I don't know how much you know about the cross. But I want you to know today that through the cross of Christ, there is healing. There is healing from sin. There is healing from guilt. There is healing from shame. There is healing from the curse of sin. The, 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 the work of the devil is destroyed. Psalm 103, 1 through 3 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and what? Heals all your diseases. It's through the cross of Christ that we have healing today. We serve a God who can heal. I love, I love, I love, I love Isaiah 53, 5. Listen to these words. You may have heard them before, but I'm going to open them up for you today. Because someone opened them up for me. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Church, listen to me. If you're sleeping, wake up. This is for you. Your transgressions are the little sins. Your iniquities are the big ones. He was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your iniquities. Abortions. Affairs, abuse, arrogance, lying, liquor, laziness, pornography, prostate cancer, prejudice, divorce, depression, dope, unforgiveness, ulcers, unhappiness. He is healer. No matter what it is, and it doesn't even have to rhyme with mine. <laughs> he is healer because he went to the cross for you. Not simply just to give you forgiveness from your sins. It says that he went there to heal you. He went there to heal you. Oh, there's so much. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Church, this is the truth this morning. I want this to be encouraging to you. But it breaks me. I don't know how to share this without being broken before you. I want to be smiling right now. But I look in my life and I look in your life and I see the desperate need for healing. And we have a God who wants to heal. It's part of his character. It is who he is. Jehovah Rapha. The God who heals. Bill Johnson, who wrote the book, When Heaven Invades Earth, pick it up, it's good, it's good, it's good, read it, write that down. When Heaven Invades Earth, says Christians have an appetite for the impossible built in. Listen, when you come into a relationship with God, believe it or not, it's in you. 
You have the appetite for the impossible. That is part of our DNA as believers, as followers. Even if we don't ex exercise it very much, we have this God who's other than us, who's out there, who's all-powerful. We tout him as amazing. Well, that just wells up in us that we have this power for the impossible. And so uh, Bill Johnson says it this way. Listen to this. This is good stuff. If people are not healed around me, I will not supply a rationale so that all those around me remain comfortable with the void. You, 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 we do this all the time, right? We, we, we ask God for healing. We don't see it happening. And we start giving God excuses so we all are feel comfortable. Because we, we don't want to embarrass God. I mean, oh, Lord, if it's your will. We, we love that. That isn't if it's his will. That's giving God the back trap door out. Just in case you don't, th we don't think you can do it. Just in case you don't do it, I want to give you the trap door out. And he says, listen, I refuse to rationalize, ra ra rationalize when God doesn't heal someone just so that we all can be comfortable. I will not lower the standard of the Bible for the level of my experiences. Let me say that again. He says, I will not lower the standard of the Bible to the level of my experiences. Church, our experiences need to be informed by our beliefs, not the other way around. So much of Christian experiences tend to bend towards what I experience is true. And that's not the case, church. What this is true, and we need to bend our experiences to the truth. He says he's a healer. If we have not been healed yet, don't rationalize it. Don't try to make ourselves more comfortable. Let's just press in. Because healing requires faith. Healing requires faith. Bill Johnson says, faith is the currency of heaven, and heaven is moved by it. Church, faith is the currency of heaven, and heaven is moved by it. God's economy is upside down, or maybe our economy is upside down. We in our economy, in our worldview, we think seeing is believing, right? If we see it, we believe it. In God's economy, what do you think it is? Believing is seeing. Not our experiences informing the truth, but the truth. Believing is seeing. That's how it comes to pass in our life. When we have faith to believe. Acts 3.16. Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can see. All can see. Do you see that? It's not just Jesus' power that healed this man. Let's read it again. I'll act like I have a higher than sixth grade reading level here. Let's try it again. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. By faith. By faith. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. Church, faith matters in healing. Faith matters. Faith is the currency of heaven. And we know the lack of faith hinders healing. Matthew chapter 13, 58. Matthew chapter 13, 58. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of... Who, who, is he, who he did not do many miracles. Who, who, is he, who, are they, who are they talking about? Jesus did not do many miracles because of a lack of faith. Some translations say... And I don't know if I can go all the way with them on this. It says that they, he could not, he could not do miracles there because of the lack of the faith. Now, I can't go all the way there, right? He did not. Faith matters, church. If you're thinking about what your role is in healing around you, faith, believing, faith in believing there are several other things that we may not have time to get into this morning that hinder our healing. A lack of faith is one I showed you. Doubt is another. Jot this down. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. Read it. It talks about it. He who doubts 
why would he ever believe that he would receive something? Some of us, the reason why our healing is hindered is because we're unwillingness, unwilling to receive it. Believe it or not, we have become comfortable in our disability. We don't want it. <laughs> we don't want healing because we don't know what life without this disability is. Now, I know 90% of you are thinking physical, and I'm talking partially physical and a lot of other things. When I say disability or dysfunction, I'm not necessarily just talking about physical. Our minds, when we talk about healing, we immediately go physical, which I don't mean, I'm not afraid of that because I believe that God can heal physically. But I think there's other ways in addition. Another thing that hinders our healing is fear. Some commentators, and I didn't check this, State the most often stated command in the Bible is do not fear. Do not fear. Fear attacks the foundation of our relationship with God. Do you believe this, church? Satan has no power except through our agreement with him. Think about fear and worry. Think about doubt. The only way those things have power in your life is if you agree with it. When we fear, we agree with the enemy. When we have faith, we agree with God. When we have fear, we agree with the enemy. When we have faith, we're agreeing with God. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we're going to bring this in for a landing. And where we're going to land today is right back in Exodus chapter 15. Verse 27 says that they went on from Mara and they ended up in a place called Elam. Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Wait a minute. They went three days without water. They come up on this body of water, and they find out it's unusable. And just down the road is Elam. Where, where there's 12 springs and 70 palm trees. God, why did, we ha why did you just take me rec directly to Elam? They were thirsty. They were hungry. They needed something. Why didn't you just provide Elam? What was the purpose of Mara? Church, you can't get to Elam unless going through Mara. God may have you at Mara, but I'm telling you, believe it. There is Elam. There's Elam. There's Elam for all of you. Learn to heal is knowing and believing that God is taking you to Elam. He's taking you to Elam, but you may have to make a stop at Mara. Amen? God delivered his people from the Red Sea. From the Egyptians. So he delivers you at the Red Sea. He teaches you at Mara. But church, I want you to know that he will show you that Ephesians 3.20, that he can do immeasurably and exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ask or think at Elam. Do you understand that? Understand the progression in your life. And it's a good Old Testament story, but it works for us today. There may have been a day, and maybe you're here today and you're not a believer, and you're not a, a, a Christian, or you're just still skeptical. I, I'm letting you in on the inside here, okay? I'm giving you insider information. This is how it rolls with God. Number one, you are delivered. And just like the Israelites were delivered the, through, through the Red Sea, right? So they were, there was this whole sea, and the Egyptians are chasing them, and they didn't have any idea how to get through there. And they were delivered because he parted the Red Sea. In our spiritual life, those of us who call ourselves Christians, those of us who have Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in our life, there came a point when we were impossibly trapped in our sin. And God delivered us through Jesus Christ. And so we were delivered but now we have traveled with God some time. And now some of us find ourselves at Mara. Amen? 
We're in the testing. We're in the difficulty. And God is dealing with us here. He's asking us to have faith. But I want you to know, God has an Elam for all of us. He has a healing for all of us. So many of us are saying, Lord, I can't get to Elam. I'll I'll never know the healing in my life. I'll, I'll never know it. You're just confusing your directions. This isn't Elam. You're at Mara. This isn't Elam. You're at Mara. He is the God who heals. We're just not at Mara. We're in Mara. We're not at Elam. And so God says, Elam is coming. Can, can I share just one more verse with you? Oh, boy. John chapter 7. I, I just have so much angst. Okay, listen to these words. This is so good. So good. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers, rivers of living water will flow from within them. This is an Old Testament. This isn't about some silly story in Exodus chapter 15. This is the truth. If this isn't true, go do something else on Sunday morning at 1030. Seriously. Plant a garden. Go. Hang out. Read a newspaper. Take a nap. Sleep in. Do something. Don't come to church. Because this is a waste of time. If that's not true. Whoever believes in me, whoever will follow me, rivers of living water, I am the Jehovah Rapha. I am the healer. This is for you. Verse 39, can we see that? By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And church, what that means for us today is, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have come before and you said, sorry, Lord, for my sin, thank you for dying on the cross for me, please come into my life and make me new, you receive the Holy Spirit. And so the way that we get received the living water that flows from within us is through the Spirit of God. And so today, I pray, God, that I pray to God that you would receive that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace for us. Lord, we thank you for your outrageous love for us. And God, if we're honest, um, one of the ways that we, um, we, we see your power manifested in our life is, is through things that are becoming not, or things that are not becoming that they are. Seeing a healing, seeing a restoration, a reconciliation, God, we, we, we desire to see those. We ask in faith that you would move in our life in those areas where we most desperately need you. And so, God, your word tells us to ask and to seek and to knock. And so today we ask, today we seek, today we knock on that door of healing. That each one of us would offer to you one thing that we desire for you to do in our lives. And God will remember that it may not be Elam today. It may be Mara. And so God will be patient. We'll have faith. We'll trust. Because we have the promise. We have the promise of the living water flowing within us. We have the promise that you are Jehovah Rapha. And so we celebrate it today. We celebrate you. We celebrate your son, Jesus Christ, who died that we might have life. And we pray it in his name.